Okay, as we continue our sermon, it's Matthew chapter 16, verses 1 through 12. Last week we had a conclusion, as each one has received a special gift. That means not just one, but we have gifts from God. We have to use it in serving one another as good stewards. As manager, we're managing God's gift to us of the manifold grace of God. Today's passage, it's about warning against false teachings. So verses one through three, it says the Pharisees and Sadducees came up and testing Jesus, they asked him to show them a sign from heaven. It's not the first time they come to Jesus and asking for a sign, but it's interesting because they're not really in good terms, in terms of the Pharisees and Sadducees. If you look at Acts chapter 23, they have this argument when Paul was addressing to them. It says, there occurred a dissension between the Pharisees and Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. For the Sadducees say that there's no resurrection, nor an angel, nor a spirit, but the Pharisees acknowledge them all. So their theology is completely different. In terms of theology, Sadducees did not believe in afterlife. So they didn't believe in those things at all. But when they found the common enemy, namely Jesus Christ, they came together to test Jesus. We see these things happening in this world as well. So it's interesting in that sense. But when they asked that question, Jesus replied to them, when it is evening, you say, it'll be fair weather for the sky is red. And in the morning, there will be a storm today for the sky is red and threatening. Do you know how to discern the appearance of the sky, but cannot discern the signs of the times? So he's criticizing these religious leaders you guys know how to discern what's happening in this world, but you cannot discern the signs of the times or spiritual matters. So let me show you how it works this way. This world is this yellow box and believers, we live in this world. So we have to go through the same thing that the world goes through. Our job, we have some hobbies, sports, games, and other things. We have personal interest, health issues and investments and other things. All these things, we're looking for a better option, better job, more fun, more entertaining hobbies, personal interest for our own improvements. So we discern which one is good for us or better for us than the others. But these are very limited things because those are focusing on the physical matters, the worldly matters but it has nothing to do with spiritual matters. As believers living in this world, we have to be careful about these things. All these things, yes, it applies to us. But are we interested in spiritual matters as well? In fact, we have to be more interested in these things because if we only focus on physical matters and worldly things, then there's no difference between the worldly people, non-believers versus believers. Let's go back to this book that I introduced you a few times. There's a book called The Christian Atheist. The subtitle, if you look at it above here, it says, believing in God, but living as if he doesn't exist. What does that mean? You don't really believe in God. If you truly believe in God, you cannot live as if he does not exist. So if you go back to the passage that we just covered, Jesus' question was this, do you know how to discern the appearance of the sky, but cannot discern the signs of the times? Those religious leaders fail to discern, understand the signs that Jesus performed. He performed so many miracles. He fed 5,000, he fed 4,000. They're still looking for more signs. It's just a reflection of their willful rejection of the gospel message. So his response continues, an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign 
and a sign will not be given it except the sign of Jonah. And we can go back to this question, an evil and adulterous generation. A lot of people who don't believe in God, they say this, if I see God, then I will believe in Him. If God tells me directly, I will believe in Him. But it's all excuses. I want to have evidence of who God is or God exists. But how many times do you go through this exercise in your regular life? When people say this is good for you, it includes a lot of minerals and protein, you just go and eat that instead of analyzing it by yourself. You don't have to see it to yourself. You never do these things for anything else, but you have to do it for God. That means we do not want to believe in God. That's all that is. So he left them and went away. In a regular setting in today's world, if it's a pastor, then they have to go beg them to come to their church. But Jesus didn't do that because he gave them enough opportunities. So willful rejection, we don't beg them to come back to the Lord. So if you look at John chapter 7, verse 1, it says this, After these things, Jesus was walking in Galilee, for because he was unwilling to walk in Judea, because the Jews were seeking to kill him. Instead of listening to his message, instead of respecting him for his miracle works, they wanted to kill him. That's a willful rejection of gospel message. So we have to discern spiritually whether we need to spend more time with these type of people versus not. Because when you look at the Old Testament, we have a good example between Saul and Samuel. So now Saul did something wrong. He was not supposed to do it. He didn't obey God 100%. And this is what he said to Samuel. Now, therefore, please pardon my sin. He realized that he committed sin and return with me that I may worship the Lord. He said all the right things, but he lost his opportunity. But Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with you for you have rejected the word of the Lord. And on top of that, the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. So when it's clear, you're not going to deal with this type of people. As Samuel turned to go, Saul seized the edge of his robe and it tore. Samuel didn't even look back. It sounds cruel. It sounds merciless. But enough opportunity was given. If they still willfully reject the word of God and instruction, there's no reason to continue and spend time with them and use your resources for them. And Jesus' warning continues. And the disciples came to the other side of the sea, but they had forgotten to bring any bread. And Jesus said to them, Watch out and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. They began to discuss this among themselves, saying, He said that because we did not bring any bread. They forgot to bring the bread, the leftovers, because they ate full. They were not hungry. Again, they were only concerned about the worldly things. The bread. And they've been watching Jesus teaching and performing miracles in multiple occasions for a long, long time. Still, they didn't get it. Well, we are slow learners too in many ways. God gives us a lot of signs, but we overlook those things and do not catch the message from God. And this is exactly what happened to the disciples. So Jesus told them this, You men of little faith, why do you discuss among yourselves that you have no bread? That's not the point, guys. Do you not yet understand or remember? the five loaves of the 5,000, and how many baskets full you picked up, or the seven loaves of the 4,000, and how many large baskets full of you picked up. Don't you remember these? Don't you understand what's going on here? But as you remember, when it happened the second time, they're still complaining. Where would you get all this bread? They're complaining about it. Once was not enough, Twice was not enough. Third time, he's reminding them, guys, please understand what's happening here. 
Obviously, Pharisees and Sadducees, they willfully rejected the message, but disciples got it finally. Because he continued, How is it that you do not understand that I did not speak to you concerning bread, but beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees? So he had to continue explaining to them. Then they understood that he did not say to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. If you think about these two group of people, the Pharisees and Sadducees, they were well-respected, well-established religious leaders. In today's term, well-respected, well-established Bible teachers and preachers in churches. And Jesus said, beware of their teachings, because they're not teaching the Bible. And this warning was not new, because if you go back to Jeremiah chapter 23, it says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Do not listen to the words of the prophets who are prophesying to you. Can you imagine this? It says, Do not listen to them, the words that they're prophesying to you. They're leading you into futility. They speak a vision of their own imagination, not from the mouth of the Lord. This is the key point. What are they teaching? Not the Bible, but their own vision, their own imagination, their own wisdom, which all come from the world, as opposed to coming from the Lord. That happened back in Jeremiah's time, Ezekiel's time, Isaiah's time, when Jesus was on this earth, and even today, it's happening. And people are gathering around these false prophets and teachers, listening to them because it's pleasing to their ears. In Jeremiah 23, verse 11 says this, For both prophet and priest are polluted. Even in my house I have found their wickedness, declares the Lord. We had a conversation a couple of weeks ago, pastors-to-be, right? Going to the seminary, we thought they were all called by God. But think twice, not always. It says, even in my house, I have found their wickedness. Even their lifestyle was immoral. They don't care about the word of God. Gaining fame, wealth through the multitude of people larger buildings that's what they gain it's not surprising to see those things happening in today's world because back then it happened too so why does it happen the bible tells us in many different places since you're working on this in jeremiah let's go back to jeremiah chapter 5 it says this an appalling and horrible thing has happened in the land the prophets prophesy falsely and the priests rule on their own authority. Their own authority means they don't care about the biblical authority. They don't care about what the Bible says. It's their own benefit, its own agenda, their own ministry. And guess what happened? And my people love it so. You cannot blame those false teachers and preachers and pastors in today's world because people love that as well. It's both ends. They're feeding each other, blind leading the blind, and they love it together. In Jeremiah 5, it says, The prophets are as wind. They're not stable. They're very shaky. And the word is not in them. The reason is the word of God is not in them. Thus, it will be done to them. They will be judged big time. The word is not in them, but they're saying, I am the prophet. I'm prophesying on behalf of God. And they are saying that. Today, multitude of churches, they do the same thing. So if the word is not in them, what do they preach and teach? The worldly wisdom, funny stories, everything but the Bible. But stark contrast between them and the Apostle Paul is here. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul said this, And when I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom. That means something other than the Bible. 
proclaiming to you the testimony of God. For because I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Based on what happened, meaning what's captured in the Bible, that's all I'm preaching to you. And a lot of times, people do not want to hear that. Don't get me wrong, all those people in Jeremiah's time, all the prophets, the reason why they preached them was people loved it, right? That means when they hear the word of God, they did not appreciate that. It was too harsh for them, and it hurt their feelings. Galatians chapter 1, Paul clearly stated this, For am I now seeking the favor of man or of God? Or am I striving to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a bond servant of Christ. If you're trying to please people, you are a bond servant, which means a slave of people, not of Christ. We have so many bond servants of people in today's church. And it continued, And my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, based on the Word of God, so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of man. Because if I preach and teach based on secular worldly wisdom, then you think you may have faith based on the wisdom of man, which is not faith at all. But he want their faith would rest on the power of God, based on the word of God. And Romans clearly says this, So faith comes from hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. Nothing else. This is the main point. We have to meditate on it. We have to love the word of God, because that gives us, and that promises us, the everlasting life. So we have to ask ourselves a question. Do we listen and follow the truth? Some people listen and decide not to follow, but some people listen and follow the truth. And who can do that? Jesus explained to us clearly. When the Jews then gathered around him and were saying to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus has been teaching them in plain language. He's been performing the miracles. He's been showing all those signs from heaven. But these people are still asking for something else, just like the Pharisees and Sadducees who are asking for a sign. That means they decide not to believe Jesus Christ. They decided to reject the message that they're hearing, and they decide to reject Jesus Christ himself. And Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, these testify of me. No more signs, no more plain talk. It shows who I am, and you don't believe. And he clarified what he meant to say here. But you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. The reason why you do not believe, the reason why you do not want to follow me is because you're not a believer. And the next verse says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them. Jesus says clearly, When the word is preached, they hear my voice, and I know them. That's not the end of the story. And they follow me. Let's ask ourselves, am I in that order? Do I listen to the voice of Christ through the word of God? More importantly, does Jesus know me? How do we know? If we follow him, we know that we are the sheep of Christ. Our conclusion is this. When Jesus went to Galilee, this is what he said. The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. So my prayer for you 
is that we all repent if we haven't done so. Because we cannot believe in the gospel without repentance. The order of things is very crucial here. Let's repent and believe in the gospel. So we follow him and know him and listen to him. But more importantly, Jesus will say that I know you. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for giving us another opportunity to worship you. A lot of times we don't understand what we are hearing, what we're reading, but that's your voice to us. Let us submit to your word so we can follow you. And please guide us with your word so we can rejoice in you forever. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of our Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you from now and forevermore. Amen.